with tales from the outer solar system. It's a very special astronomer whose cats have more Twitter followers than she does. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cat Poker. solar system is, and whether or not there might be some planets lurking out there for us to discover. And then I'm going to make some predictions about what the future holds. So our solar system has two so-called debris disks, if we were talking in a more astrophysical uh, context. The first is the asteroid belt of the inner solar system, which Andy Rifkin is going to tell you a little bit more about asteroids. And then in the outer solar system, we have the Kuiper belt. So this is a top-down view of all of the known objects in the Kuiper Belt as of when I made this plot a couple months ago. So these are just the four giant planets, their circles showing where their orbits are. So us on our little planet Earth are here in the center, not really visible on this plot because the solar system is too big and we don't really matter to the outer solar system. Yeah, I know. So we've got Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and then Neptune out here at 30 AU. And all of these little dots are known Kuiper Belt objects in the solar system. Now that's the top-down view. We can take a side view of the same plot and see that these things are you know, roughly in the same plane as the planets, but they're a little bit puffed up, uh, much like the asteroid belt is. Some of them are on inclined orbits. Some of them are quite a bit away from the plane of the planets. Um, but this is, this is our picture so far that we have observationally. But how did we actually build this picture up? These are objects that are very far away. How do we actually know they're out there? Um, and we find new objects by taking images of the night sky and looking for things that move against the background stars. So the stars are really, really far away, and they appear to be stationary from where we are. But things that are closer to us in the solar system appear to move against that background, both because they're orbiting the sun and because we are on a moving observing platform called the Earth that is also orbiting the sun. So when we take pictures of the night sky, um, here are Jupiter and Saturn over the course of uh, 11 months doing their dance across the sky, um, doing this so-called retrograde loop where they appear to turn around. That was the first clue that we were looking at something besides things that were orbiting the Earth. Um, and then over here, a bit harder to spot is this asteroid, which might not be able to see the pointer. Uh, moving against the background stars. So that's how we find things. Um, now, we have a fairly good inventory of the asteroids in the solar system, um, and that's for a couple of reasons. This is a plot from 1800 to roughly today, although it's a little bit out of date now, uh, of the number of asteroids we know of over time. Now, this is a log plot on the y-axis, which means that the bottom is one object the next big tick mark is 10, then 100, then 1,000. You can see we are up here, you know, well over into the several hundred thousand known asteroids in the solar system. And early on, we had quite a few, you know, even in uh, up to about 1,000 objects by 100 years ago. And that's because asteroids are fairly close to both the Earth and the Sun. So we are looking at these things in reflected sunlight when we take pictures of them. So the closer you are to the source of that sunlight, the brighter you are. And the closer you are to the observer, us on Earth, the brighter you are. So asteroids are quite a bit brighter than things that are much farther away. They also move pretty fast because they're both orbiting the sun fairly quickly and because uh, we see parallax motion from the Earth moving. And things display more parallax when they're close to you. You can do the trick of putting your finger in front of your eye and blinking your eyes back and forth and you'll see more motion close to your face than far away from your face. So this allowed many asteroids to be discovered on photographic plates of the night sky, where you're actually just exposing chemicals on a glass plate, and then you're doing this awful thing, putting them on a blink comparator that, oh, the idea makes me really motion sick, where you have one image on the left, one image on the right, 
and you look through this hole and you blink back and forth between the images and play spot the difference. <sighs> That's how we though discovered Pluto, um, one of the relatively few outer solar system objects discovered um, on photographic plates this way. So this is January 23rd, 1930. Pluto is indicated by the arrow, because otherwise you'd never find it without staring for a very long time. And then, you know, a few days later on January 29th, it has moved. So Pluto was really hard to find on these photographic plates, but it's considered an extremely bright Kuiperbell object. That's super bright by outer solar system standards. Um, so this is going to play into the story when I, in a couple slides, compare how our inventory looks for the outer solar system compared to the inner solar system. So a more modern survey, of course, uses digital cameras to take images of the sky. And then we use computers to do a comparison of those images. And the computers do this horrible spot the difference game for us and spot the moving objects. And you can pick them out nicely here. So this is um, an object discovered in the Outer Solar System Origins Survey, which is a project I'm a part of, but I did not do any of the data processing. Um, other people did that harder work. Um, and this is one of these objects here. This is considered a bright object from our survey. And yet, to get this detection here, each image, and this is three images linked sequentially, we had to expose on a four meter telescope for two minutes, open the shutter, let the digital camera collect lights for two minutes, and then over the span of about two hours, we took these three images, and then you can see this Kuiper Belt object. Now for comparison, I chose this particular image because there is an interloper in one of the frames that um, the person who did a lot of this blinking, Michelle Bannister, calls the vermin of the data set. There is an asteroid sinking its way into our Kuiper Belt survey. So I just, I like this comparison because, so this red arrow here is showing you how much a Kuiper Belt object moves over the course of two hours. And this is the motion of an asteroid. This streak is the asteroid moving over the two minute image exposure. So it's moving a lot faster. Also, it's bright enough that even though it's trailing across many pixels on the camera, it still shows up. Um, if you had a Kuiper Belt object, something the same brightness as this Kuiper Belt object trailing like that, it would just look like the background noise. So this just illustrates why it is a lot harder, um, just intrinsically, to find these outer solar system objects in these surveys. And that's why when we do the side-by-side -side comparison of the number of discoveries we've had over time in the Kuiper Belt versus the Asteroid Belt, um, here this is starting again, 1800. I didn't plot this until 1930 when we finally had Pluto. But then there's this huge gap before the invention of the digital camera, essentially. And we finally started to pick up in the number of cumulative uh, Kuiper Belt objects known. So we're sitting right now at about 2,000 or so known Kuiper Belt objects, which is roughly where we were in the asteroid belt about 100 years ago. So Kuiper Belt science is 100 years behind asteroid belt science because these things are just so much more difficult to find. We had to wait until we had digital cameras and computers to process those images. Um, so let's talk about the completeness of our inventory of these populations. So for the asteroids, we have probably seen all of the 10 kilometer asteroids. That's pretty good. And we've seen most of the one kilometer ones. And this is because they're easier to spot because they're brighter, and also because there's money, because they're hazardous, which you're going to talk about in the next talk. For comparison, the smallest ever observed Kuiper Belt object is 30 kilometers across, very roughly. 30 kilometers compared to we're essentially complete in the asteroid population for 10 kilometer things. And the only reason we even have one down at 30 kilometers is because of the lovely New Horizons mission. To discover this 30 kilometer Kuiper Belt object required using the Hubble Space Telescope because it was too hard to image from the ground. But we needed somewhere to send that spacecraft after it flew by Pluto, so we were able to get those resources. More typically, the things we're seeing in the Kuiper Belt and discovering are you know, 100 kilometers or so across, and we're frequently finding new dwarf planets, Pluto sized objects. So we're pretty incomplete in terms of our object inventory in the outer solar system. 
And in fact, there's been much press over the last couple of years um, saying that maybe there's some really big things lurking out in the outer solar system. So if we look at all of the orbits of the known Kuiper Belt objects, these are just plotted kind of top down and a little bit side on, we see that these really, really distant orbits aren't quite randomly oriented, or so they appear. And there's been some hints that maybe that's due to another gravitational influence in the outer solar system. There's debates about this. It may or may not be a real clustering, but it's really spurred this idea of what could be lurking out there. And I've even um, kind of weighed in on that and said maybe there's a Mars mass that even closer in, again, based on looking at the orbits of the known type of objects. And, you know, this is not implausible, because really the only thing we can say with 100% certainty about the outer solar system is we're pretty sure there's no more gas giants to be found. Um, and that's because we have surveyed the entire sky in the infrared. Uh, gas giants, this things as big as Jupiter and Saturn, give off their own radiation, and they would have been seen probably within uh, 10,000 or so AU of the sun, depending on your models of the planets. We're one AU from the sun. The Kuiper Belt is a few hundred AU from the sun at most. So good, we know there's no more, most likely, gas giants. But that's about all we can say with certainty. Because if we kind of look at a map of the sky, and we kind of estimate how well we've surveyed different parts of the sky to different depths looking for these really faint objects, and there's quite a few gaps. So in this plot here, um, yellow and orange are really deep surveys that look for really faint things. Um, blue and black are places we haven't really surveyed very well, and this is just approximate. But it shows you that there's quite a few gaps in our coverage. Um, so even for these dwarf planet-sized or even maybe planet-sized objects, there's room for new discoveries. Um, and the thing I'm really excited about with LSST is how much this is going to improve this sky coverage map and give us some really good answers about the outer solar system. Because very roughly, and I did this with like Microsoft Paint equivalent of just slapping things on, but this is roughly what this guy from LSST has done. You know, the entire southern sky and a little bit of this north um, ecliptic part is going to be essentially orange on this scale, surveyed very well for faint moving objects. Um, and they expect uh, 40,000 new Kuiper Belt objects. Remember, our current inventory sits at 2,000. So it's going to be an entirely new era for the Kuiper Belt with a huge playground of new objects to look at. Um, and that's going to start in 2022. You know, it's going to take many years because these things move very slowly against the background stars. It takes a long time to figure out what kind of orbits they're on, um, figure out what kind of objects they are. So it's not like in 2023 we'll have those 40,000 new objects for you. But, you know, several years into this process we'll have a much better picture. So I'm really excited to see what we're going to find with LSST. And it's going to completely revamp our idea of the outer solar system. Thank you. Um, if you do find like a larger, a larger object out there, what, are, what would be the theories about how it goes the first Okay, so the question is, if we find a larger object in the outer solar system, what would be the theories for where it came from and how it got out there? And that is a really good question because. The answer is we don't have great ideas about how stuff would get out there. So one possibility is that we think our giant planets in the solar system might not be the only giant planets the solar system has ever had. It's possible that we have another Uranus or Neptune mass planets when the giant planets were forming. Because they didn't form where we find them today. They had to move to their current locations. And some of the different ideas about how they moved there involves extra planets that we could have injected into the outer solar system, although it's really difficult to get them on the stable orbits in the outer solar system. Um, similarly, you could capture a free-floating planet, but again, it's really difficult. So I think we'll have a whole bunch of new problems to solve if we find a really big object out there. To, to track the objects into the inner solar system? Yes, that's a good question. So the question is, are we monitoring these objects and kind of tracking how they come into the inner solar system? 
Um, and the answer is they don't come into the inner solar system on time scales, like human time scales. But they do come into the inner solar system on a million year time scales and longer. So some of those comments that you heard about in the last talk came from the Kuiper Belt. But they come in from the Kuiper Belt and they spend about 10 million years kind of intermingling with the giant planets before they come into the inner solar system. So it's a very slow process. But we see these intermediate populations. And that is another thing that LSST will give us a much better picture of, is this intermediate population that we call the centaurs, that orbit between Jupiter and Neptune. So all these small body populations are related to each other, but we're still kind of hammering out the details, and more data will definitely help us do that. Are you able to get much smaller than the current 30 kilometer uh, small video? Um, so are we going to see things much smaller than that 30 kilometer, the smallest KVM we've seen? Um, the answer to that is probably no. Um, for things that are in the Kuiper Belt currently, um, we'll get smaller, I think I know what the smallest, I know in visual magnitude, so. <laughs> um, but getting down to 30 kilometers is very difficult. Um, for this intermediate population, between Jupiter and Neptune, we can get down to sizes like that. But we're probably still stuck with the 50 to 100 kilometer roughly things in the type of um, Why is there such a well defined region of like no uh, sky observation on that map of like what we've seen? Ah, good question. So, here? Yeah. Okay, so the question is why are there some uh, regions in this? plot that are black, where we have not seen objects until advance, advance. So the answer is it's the galactic plane. Um, so we are in the Milky Way galaxy, and when we look out into the night sky, um, if you've ever looked out and seen the Milky Way, there's a brighter patch of sky that's there because of all of the stars in the galaxy that we're seeing. Now, because we have not in the past been able to look at the entire sky, typically when we're surveying, we pick the easier parts of sky to start with. The galactic plane is a really tricky area of the sky to survey because there are so many background stars that it's really easy to lose these faint objects against the background stars. So LSST is going to survey, including the galactic plane, and that's a potential area where we might find some really bright objects. Um, but we've been avoiding that just because of limited time. There are pictures of that sky, obviously, that exist. It's just that when you're doing a targeted moving object survey, you stick to the easier parts of the sky and you can't do the whole sky anyway. But again, that'll change with elevated Good question. Okay, uh, one more. Um, I think you have your hand up. Yep. What allowed Pluto to be found so much sooner than other hyperbolic objects? So the question is, what allowed Pluto to be found so much sooner than other hyperbolic objects? And the answer to that is, I think, persistence and also a false idea of what was out there. So they were looking for Pluto because they thought they were seeing some anomalies in Neptune's orbit around the sun. Um, so Neptune itself is discovered because when we observed Uranus, the planet just inside of Neptune, its orbit was being perturbed by something. We could tell that there was something out there gravitationally tugging at it. And lo and behold, they found Neptune. Um, and they thought they were seeing a similar anomaly in Neptune's orbit and thus launched this uh, search for this really big planet, planet nine. Um, and Pluto just serendipitously happened to be in the part of the sky they thought it was, but it was all a mistake. It was far too small to have affected Neptune's orbit. Um, but they were really convinced, um, and it was just persistence, because it was a really hard discovery to make using photographic plates. All right, uh, I think that was all the time. <laughs> Thank you. And our last speaker wants you to know that he's completed the Kessel Run in less than nine parsecs. Please join me in welcoming Andy Ripken. Hello, Seattle! Hello, Seattle!